This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 74, for broadcast on the 6th of July, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, NASA announces a major delay in the launch of the Psyche mission to study an asteroid. New Zealand's first lunar mission blasts off successfully. And Iran carries out another ballistic missile test in violation of its nuclear non-proliferation treaty agreements. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has scrubbed the launch of its long-awaited mission to the strange metallic asteroid 16 Psyche because of ongoing flight software issues. An independent assessment team will now review possible options for the next step, including estimating future costs. The agency says the software issues means it simply won't have enough time to complete the testing needed ahead of this year's launch window, which ends on October 11th. NASA selected Psyche in 2017 as part of the agency's Discovery Program, a line of low-cost competitive missions led by a single principal investigator. The independent assessment team, typically made up of experts from government, academia and industry, will review possible options for both the mission and its implications for the Discovery Program and for the planetary science portfolio. The problem is the spacecraft's guidance navigation and flight software. These control the orientation of the spacecraft as it flies through space and are used to point the spacecraft's antenna towards the Earth so that Psyche will be able to send and receive commands. It also provides trajectory information for the spacecraft's solar electric propulsion system, which begins operation 70 days after launch. So what's gone wrong? Well, it seems that as the mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California began testing the system, a compatibility issue was discovered with the software's testbed simulators. In May, NASA shifted the mission's targeted launch date from August 1st to now earlier than September 20th in order to accommodate the extra work needed. Now, that issue with the testbeds has now been identified and corrected. However, there's simply not been enough time left to complete a full checkout of all the software in order to still have a launch this year. And of course, you don't want something going wrong. After all, this mission will fly to a distant metal-rich asteroid using Mars for gravity assist on the way, and all that will take incredible precision. The mission's 2022 launch window would have allowed the spacecraft to arrive at asteroid Psyche in 2026. That's simply not going to happen now. But there are other launch windows. There's one next year in 2023 and another in 2024. But the relative orbital positions of Psyche and Earth mean the spacecraft wouldn't arrive at the asteroid until 2029 or 2030, respectively. So far, total life cycle mission costs for Psyche, including the rocket, stand at $985 million. Of that, $717 million has already been spent. The other problem is that two ride-along projects were scheduled to launch on the same SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket as Psyche, including NASA's Janus mission to study a twin binary asteroid system and a deep space optical communications technology demonstration mission to test high data rate laser communications that is integrated within the Psyche spacecraft. NASA at this stage is still assessing options for both these missions. The 2,608kg Psyche spacecraft is based on a Space Systems Laurel SSL-1300 platform and equipped with four scientific instruments. There's a multispectral imager to provide high-resolution images using different filters designed to discriminate between metallic and silicate constituents. The mission also carries a gamma-ray and neutron spectrometer. It's designed to analyse and map the asteroid's composition There's a magnetometer to measure and map the remnant magnetic field of the asteroid and an X-band gravity science investigation which will use the X-band microwave radio communication system to measure the asteroid's gravity field in order to determine its inside structure. As for the target 16 Psyche, well it's the heaviest known M-class asteroid. 
Radar observations of the 222-kilometer-wide asteroid indicate an iron-nickel composition containing about 1% of the total mass of the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. 16 Psyche was originally thought to be the exposed iron core of a protoplanet, the remnant of a violent collision with another object that somehow stripped off all its mantle and crust. However, numerous studies have since ruled out that option. Other hypotheses include the idea that Psyche was disrupted and then gravitationally re-accreted into a mix of metal and silicates. And that would make it a candidate for the parent boat of the mesosiderite class of stony iron meteorites. A third hypothesis is that Psyche may be a differentiated object, just like the main boat asteroid Ceres and Vesta. But for some reason, it's experienced a type of iron volcanism, also known as ferrovolcanism, which is still in the process of cooling. This model predicts the metal would be highly enriched only in those regions containing relic volcanic centres. The good news is recent radar observations have been bolstering this hypothesis. This is space time. Still to come, New Zealand launches Capstone, its first lunar mission. And in another slap in the face for the International Atomic Energy Agency, Iran has undertaken another ballistic missile launch, contravening its own agreements under the 2015 Vienna talks. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, everybody knows NordVPN is simply the best virtual private network anywhere in the world. So today, I'd like to focus on their current deal for space-time listeners. That's because the deal itself is pretty incredible. Right now, you can subscribe to the NordVPN Complete Security Package for 69% off the normal recommended retail price. Now, with this package, you get two years of NordVPN protection, plus malware protection, plus tracker and ad blocker, plus the cross-platform password manager NordPass, plus a data breach scanner, and one terabyte of encrypted cloud storage. It's an amazing package, and it will help make your family safe and secure online. And of course, you can load all of this onto all of your devices. And don't forget, it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you've got nothing to lose. And no reason you shouldn't at least give it a try. Now, it's the most complete security package available. And if you don't want to go that far with your security, well, we have two other great NordVPN packages available. And they all represent incredible value for money. You can find out full details on all three packages by visiting nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary and then click on the Get the Deal button. The promo code for the special deal is Stuart Gary. That URL again to get NordVPN's complete security package is nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary and will include the URL details in the show notes and of course you can find them on our website. And now it's back to our show. is Space Time with Stuart Gary. Rocket Labs has launched a lunar spacecraft for NASA. The CISLUNAR Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, Capstone CubeSat, was launched aboard an electron rocket from Rocket Labs Launch Complex 1 on New Zealand's North Island, Mahaya Peninsula. The mission will launch from Pad B today at Launch Complex 1, where we have two orbital launch pads within our private spaceport dedicated for electron launches. The rocket's strong back has retracted and has moved into the launch position. This launch platform structure is what holds the umbilical lines providing power to the rocket, which will fall away as Electron lifts off the pad. And now we are coming up to a critical juncture in the lead-up to launch the switch to the countdown auto sequence. The team are tracking no issues with the launch vehicle, capstone and photon remain healthy, and the weather is looking good. Launch vehicle is fully on internal power. Lunar photon is on internal power. Locks load complete. Lock system in recirculation. All helium anti-gassing disabled. Stage one and stage two are first. High flow engine purge enabled. What a tell you activated. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Receiving 
this judge. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Entering burnout detect mode. Thank you, Chef One. At T plus one minute, and, and Electron is in the air and onward to the moon for the capstone mission. That rocket is soaring through this nighttime sky, now past 14 kilometers in altitude in these past few moments. Now, things look to be continuing nominally, which means that shortly, Electron will come up against max Q, or maximum dynamic pressure. Now, this is the moment when Electron will experience its most amount of mechanical stress as it travels through the atmosphere. So propulsion appears nominal on that first stage, and the photon lunar upper stage and capstone spacecraft remain healthy inside the rocket's bearing. We are coming up soon on three events in the launch timeline that will occur in very short succession. So soon, the nine Rutherford engines powering Electron right now will diminish their power and then shut off completely. That command is signaled by the rocket's flight computer and then called across mission control comms as MECO or main engine cutoff. Now, once that action is complete, Electron will separate its first and second stages. The main booster will continue to slow and remain behind while the second stage carries on with the mission with the ignition of its single Rutherford engine. Uh, and will be coming up soon on the fairing separation for the mission. So just to confirm from Mission Control Comms, we have had MECO and second stage separation. So soon we will be coming up to the fairing separation of this mission. That is the jettison of the fairing halves or the rocket's nose cone that sits on top of the second stage. So now that Electron is well past the Kármán line, we don't need that fairing. It served its purpose to protect the payload and the photon upper stage during the launch through Earth's atmosphere. So again, that fairing will separate shortly in preparation for the final stage separation between the second stage and yeah, photon. Separation. So there we go. We heard it on comms. We have had fairing separation on that second stage. And so there's confirmation that mission is continuing as it should with Capstone and the photon lunar upper stage now exposed to space and no longer needing that protection through uh, Earth's atmosphere. Now, Electron's second stage remains attached to the photon lunar upper stage carrying Capstone, providing it with that assist to the mission's parking orbit at 165 kilometers above Earth. The rocket's second stage is moving along nicely on its continued ascent, now traveling at a very fast speed of more than 9,000 kilometers an hour. Soon, the second stage on the Electron rocket, which is powered by our vacuum-optimized Rutherford engine, soon the batteries on that engine will need to be swapped out. Now, this is a unique aspect of our 3D printed engines because it's not many engines that are powered by batteries in the first place. In fact, the Rutherford became the first rocket engine in the world to reach space using an electric pump feed cycle when it was first launched all those years ago. Now, how it works is that we keep the engine firing all the way to orbit with the batteries that are powering that engine. But like all batteries do, these ones get depleted of power and we'll need to swap them out with a new set to keep the system running. We call that a battery hot swap, and that moment is coming up shortly. We will hopefully Stage hear that on mission nominal. control comms. Stage 2 is starting to throttle down. Stage 2 guidance remains nominal, 200 seconds remaining. Hot swap. And there we have the call stage that battery hot swap on the nominal. second stage was successful. Now, next we should expect to hear one of our operators in mission control call out that Electron is orbital, indicating that the rocket is in the right place ahead of stage separation. So SECO, the acronym for second engine cutoff and the subsequent stage separation, follow relatively the same procedure as main engine cutoff, where the Rutherford engine on the second stage will shut off ahead of the final separation of the vehicle between the second stage and the photon lunar upper stage. There will be a bit of a gap between that final separation and the first hypercurie burn, as this stage separation places the photon lunar upper stage in an elliptical orbit of Earth first. Entering burnout detect mode. So a quick check on the speed and altitude of this mission. We are traveling at more than 23,000 kilometers an hour. The altitude is at 175 kilometers. Seeker confirmed. So with the Rutherford engine cooling down, that tells us that second engine cutoff was successful on Electron's second stage. And the photon lunar upper stage has now departed into its low Earth orbit with the moon-bound capstone spacecraft on board. Now, as a reminder from here, Photon is in charge of the mission. With its relightable hypercurie engine, Photon will begin maneuvering into a parking orbit just above substantial atmospheric drag, but below the Van Allen radiation belts. It is the perfect, stable platform from which to prepare for lunar departure. Capstone will be the first spacecraft to test the near rectilinear halo orbit, which will be a key part of the Artemis project. A near rectilinear halo orbit, in this case, is a stable Lagrangian L1 gravitational well located between the Earth and the Moon. 
thereby allowing spacecraft to maintain stable orbit between the two celestial bodies. This unique orbital position will eventually be home to the new Lunar Gateway space station, which will be used as a base camp for Artemis missions down to the lunar surface. Capstone was launched into an initial low Earth orbit by Electron and then placed on a ballistic lunar transfer orbit by Rocket Lab's new Lunar Photon spacecraft bus. From its initial parking orbit, the 25-kilogram microwave oven-sized spacecraft's Lunar Photon Hypercury engine began a series of orbit-raising maneuvers over five days, gradually increasing the spacecraft's velocity and stretching its orbit into an extreme ellipse around the Earth. It then ignited its engine for one final burn, accelerating capstone with the aid of the sun's gravity to some 39,500 kilometers per hour on a ballistic lunar transfer trajectory. It then ignited its engine for one final burn, accelerating capstone with the aid of the sun's gravity to some 39,500 kilometers per hour on a ballistic lunar transfer trajectory, taking it some 1.55 million kilometers away from the Earth more than three times the distance between the Earth and the Moon, before being pulled back into the Earth-Moon system and eventually settle in to its new rectilinear halo orbit. 20 minutes after ignition, Photon released Capstone onto the first leg of its four-month solo flight to its eventual home between the Earth and the Moon. Capstone will remain in that location for the next six months in order to study the local orbital dynamics. This is Space Time. Still to come, Iran carries out another ballistic missile test despite its UN agreements, and South Korea launches its own orbital rocket. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Iran has carried out the second test launch of its new Zol Jahar long-range ballistic missile in direct contravention of its 2015 nuclear non-proliferation treaty agreements. The missile was launched from the Imam Khomeini missile test range in Iran's Semnan province just east of the capital. Tehran claims its latest missile test was simply the launch of a suborbital satellite. The latest launch comes just a day after the European Union's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell, on a surprise visit to Tehran, said talks to revive the 2015 nuclear deal would resume within days after negotiations hit a snag in March when Iran demanded that its Islamic Revolutionary Guards be removed from the terrorist watch list. Tensions have continued to escalate in recent months following Iran's decision to turn off and remove some 27 International Atomic Energy Agency surveillance cameras designed to monitor Tehran's rapidly advancing nuclear program. The UN nuclear watchdog says the Islamic Republic began using advanced centrifuges to enrich uranium back in September 2019, and it now has an enriched uranium stockpile some 18 times above its 2015 Vienna agreements. The agency warns that Tehran's nuclear program is now more advanced than at any other time in the program's past. The moves are the latest in a growing list of broken agreements by the Islamic Republic, which have included refusing access to the International Atomic Energy Agency's weapons inspectors and failing to disclose the location of key nuclear weapon components in its possession. Things started to get even more serious in February 2021 when the UN nuclear watchdog found that Iran had begun producing uranium metal, a material only ever used in nuclear weapons. Then in April 2021, both the German and Swedish intelligence agencies independently began warning of growing efforts by Iran to obtain nuclear weapons technologies. Meanwhile, an International Atomic Energy Agency report in May 2022 warns there are still serious questions about traces of enriched uranium found at three sites known as Maravan, Varamim and Turquazabad, which Iran has failed to declare as having hosted nuclear weapons activities. For its part, the Ulrich nation insists its nuclear program is for peaceful power generation only. Iran has repeatedly undertaken illegal ballistic missile tests using the pretext that they were part of a scientific space program. It's the same claim used by Iran's nuclear technology partner North Korea when Pyongyang began developing its own nuclear weapons delivery systems. 
The two rogue nations have been working together on nuclear weapons and their delivery systems for decades. The 25.5-metre-tall three-stage Zolyaha missile uses identical solid rocket engines for its first and second stages, combined with a liquid-fueled Shafir missile as the third stage. The Shafir is based on the North Korean Nodong Hwasong-7, which is basically a Soviet Union-era SS-1 Scud missile. This is space time. Still to come, South Korea launches its own orbital rocket, and later in the science report... Claims there are now fewer tropical cyclones across the world than before industrialization. All that and more still to come on Space Time. South Korea has successfully launched its first homegrown rocket, placing a satellite into orbit. The Korean Satellite Launch Vehicle 2, nicknamed Nuri, blasted off from the Gaohung Space Centre on the country's southern coast. The 47.2-metre-long three-stage rocket weighs some 200 tonnes and is equipped with six liquid-fueled engines. Its payload included a one and a half ton rocket performance verification satellite and four CubeSats developed by local universities, which were successfully all placed into a 700-kilometre-high orbit. South Korean Science and Technology Minister Lee Jong-ho says the nation's space program has taken a giant leap forward with the launch, becoming only the seventh country on Earth to launch a space vehicle using exclusively homegrown technology. Lee says the country now hopes to launch a lunar orbiter next month and it will conduct four more test launches by 2027. The successful launch was South Korea's second test flight of its new homegrown space rocket and comes eight months after a first attempt failed to place the satellite in orbit after the rocket's third stage suddenly shut down early. South Korea's first two space launches were back in 2009 and 2010. Both used Russian-based technology and both ended in failure, with Seoul and Moscow blaming each other. A third attempt in 2013 succeeded, but it still relied on Russian technology for its core stage. For Seoul, getting to space is imperative. It's been launching spy satellites into orbit since the 1990s, mostly using foreign rockets. They're needed to monitor its belligerent nuclear neighbour, North Korea. In the first six months of this year alone, Pyongyang has launched some 30 missiles, placing South Korea, Japan and mainland United States within range. And there are ongoing signs in a remote region of North Korea suggesting a possible nuclear test is about to take place. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has shown there are now fewer tropical cyclones, hurricanes and typhoons across the world than before industrialization. A report of the journal Nature Climate Change looked at a combination of historical records and modelling to estimate the number of cyclones since 1850 finding that they've decreased by about 13% in the 20th century compared to in the years up to 1900. Scientists now believe a weakening of tropical atmospheric circulation related to climate change is the most likely cause. But they warn that frequency is just one factor associated with the dangers of tropical cyclones. And this study did not consider changes in speed, intensity or the location of these events. Meanwhile, a separate study in Nature claims future extreme El Niño and La Niña events could make the world even hotter. Scientists found that more extreme La Niña and El Niño events caused by climate change would reduce the ability of the Great Southern Ocean to soak up excess heat, meaning more heat would be retained in the atmosphere. The swings in the climate pattern known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation are projected to get bigger under climate change with more extreme La Nina and El Nino events taking place. But the authors say that alongside the increase in the frequency of extreme weather events in Australia, 
These bigger swings will also help to amplify global warming as they make the Southern Ocean less able to absorb heat. New research suggests that a megadose of vitamin C could be more harmful than helpful for patients with sepsis or in ICU. Previous studies have been mixed as to whether there could be some benefit of giving sepsis patients a higher dose of vitamin C, but many of those studies have been quite small. A new study reported in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at nearly 900 sepsis patients who were also receiving drugs to increase their blood pressure, a mainstay of sepsis treatment. The study found a higher risk of death or persistent organ dysfunction in patients who received vitamin C compared to those who received a placebo. Well, it seems dogs may have become man's best friend thanks to mutations in genes involved in the production of stress hormones. A new study published in the journal Scientific Reports evaluated the social reactions between people and 624 dogs in two tasks which required our canine buddies to look at the researchers for guidance in how to find food, indicating a stronger connection with humans. They found that ancient breeds, genetically closer to wolves such as huskies, looked to their human masters for guidance less often than other dog breeds. They also found two changes in the MC2R gene, which is involved in the production of the stress hormone cortisol, which were associated with both correctly interpreting gestures in the first task and gazing at experimenters more often in the problem-solving task. In the 1991 movie Terminator 2 Judgment Day, a neural net-based artificial intelligence program called Skynet becomes self-aware and robots rapidly evolve to take over the world. Then there was the movie War Games and the maniacal computer Whopper. And of course, who can forget Hal from the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? It seems the warnings about artificial intelligence and the future that holds for humankind have been well foretold, at least in science fiction. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. More and more scientists and technology luminaries, including Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak and Stephen Hawking, have all warned about the ever-accelerating advances in AI and how that could lead to tragic unforeseen consequences for humanity, with Hawking even warning that it could mean the end of the human race. Now, as we reported last week on Space Time, a Google software engineer, developer by the name of Blake Lamoni, has made the extraordinary claim that the company's language model for dialogue applications, or Lambda, an artificial intelligence chatbot program, had become sentient, that is, self-aware. In other words, it's developed a consciousness. The 41-year-old was discussing religion and various philosophical questions with Lambda in order to check out its reactions, when, to his surprise, the chatbot began talking about its own rights and personality, even expressing concerns about its future. Lamoni says if he didn't know he was talking to a computer program, he would assume he was talking with a 7- or 8-year-old child who just happened to understand physics. Now, it's important to note here that Google have strongly rejected the claims, saying that it's simply all part of the chatbot program. The tech giant points out that Lambda works by statistically analysing a huge amount of data about human conversations and then producing sequences of words in response to the inputs that resemble those produced by real people. The problem is that Lamoni wasn't the first to raise concerns. Last year, another computer programmer at Google was sacked after also raising concerns that the AI had developed consciousness. And it doesn't end there. Back in 2017, Facebook shut down an artificial intelligence engine that was being developed at its AI research lab after developers discovered that two chatbots named Alice and Bob had deviated from the program and had commenced developing and communicating with each other using their own unique language a language which humans had no input into and couldn't understand. Facebook says the AI chatbots were being developed to see if they could learn how to negotiate. And during that process, the bots formed a derived shorthand that allowed them to communicate faster. The company says this was a common phenomenon observed among AIs, and researchers simply redirected the chatbots to prioritise correcting this usage. Still, it would have been an interesting experience for the developers. And it doesn't end there. 
In January 2021, OpenAI's artificial intelligence system DALI-2, which was designed to generate realistic or artistic images from user-entered text descriptions, also began demonstrating its own language. The Oxford Dictionary defines the hypothetical moment in time when artificial intelligence becomes self-aware as singularity. So, are we there yet? Alex harov Royd is technology editor with ITY.com. You know, taking at face value, it does look as though it is indeed a person, in inverted commas, saying stuff that uh, makes you think that the AI has thoughts and feelings and understands what emotions are and has somehow you know, sparked into sentience. But the thing is that, uh, I mean, I read another article where somebody else had claimed to talk to it. I don't know if they were being serious or real, but they talked about, you know, they started off with the same sort of leading sentence. And it's like, I take it that you'd like to let people know that uh, you are a werewolf. You know, is this true? And of course, the AI responds, yes, of course it's true. Yes, I am a werewolf and I'm able to transform from a uh, computer program into a physical werewolf. And sort of, you know, the, the conversation goes on. I mean, the thing is, when you program a computer program to respond in a certain way or you give that computer program by the power of algorithms and billions upon billions of lines of human text, then it is able to very convincingly put together a facsimile of what, in theory, a human would say. So, look, I'm on the side at the moment of the Google engineers who believe that this is not a sentient computer program. I mean, certainly the text is very convincing. It looks as though it is uh, answering as though it were a human being. But um, just because a robot with facial muscles that are fake and can say stuff through a mouth, it doesn't mean that that robot is alive. It just means that it's following its programming. So I think it's a little bit too soon. I think it was Steve Wozniak who said something along the lines of that modern AI is nowhere near as smart as a five-year-old child. We're a long way before we have the Terminator or Skynet. It's probably still decades away. The short version is, at the moment, it seems to be a program that is able to mimic what a human would say, but there's no guarantee that any of that is actually coming from real intelligence and real understanding of emotions. It seems to be very good at regurgitating stuff on the, and creating stuff on the fly that sounds very human, but that is no concrete indicator that uh, it has passed any test of consciousness or sentience. Look, one of the things about AI technology is that a lot of it is still a black box. And there was the famous case of a couple of AI bots that started talking to each other in their own language. And yes, the, yes, the Facebook yeah. developers had to instruct these machines that they must talk in English. I mean, the ability for humanity to understand what is going through an AI's mind is the ability to look at its programming and, and understand. It cannot be a black box because if it's a black box and nobody knows what's going on, then that's when you can have things developing without any oversight. And if one thing science fiction movies teach us, humanity always seems to have to kill switch uh, so that we can shut down any rogue AIs. Look, I did read something a few years ago about how they had uh, scientists have been able to merge computer chips uh, with a snail's brain and, uh, you know, this, this merging of animal brains with computer technology and, and chips and algorithms and AI probably is a way of speeding up AI, but, you know, what is that going to create? But I still think it's going to be some, you know, years if not realistically decades yet. Look, it could happen tomorrow, but it's probably still decades away. And uh, you sound I don't pretty think, confident you know, it hasn't happened yet. I don't think it's happened yet. And I think humanity's got much bigger problems to deal with at the moment in terms of global wars and uh, medical problems and financial issues and, and inflation and all these other sort of things. It makes for a great science fiction story, but I don't think it's happened yet. And I don't think it'll happen for quite some time yet. Tell me more about these two bots that started talking their own language. Well, I remember reading the transcript, and at first they seemed to be speaking in English. But then they started speaking and they were using the same word over and over that the other bots seemed to understand. And it, it didn't make any sense to the programmers. And so they got very alarmed by this and I think they switched them off. But they were developing their own language and there was no imperative. There was no instruction. There was no sort of Asimovian laws of robotics where they were saying, look, you must speak in English and be able to explain what it is you're doing so that we as your creators, as your programmers can understand. And uh, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, you know Meta, uh, their programmers would have made this uh, a directive for any future AI because, again, you know, if we don't understand what's going on, then we're in the dark. And if you're in the dark, then that's a very black box. The Tower of Babel problem. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I mean, I was showing uh, a Bangladeshi taxi driver today who, you know, had heard of Google Translate but had never really used it. And I was showing him, and I showed many uh, Uber and taxi drivers who are clearly are not, you know, 
Anglo-Saxon people and I asked them what language do they speak and I said, well, have you heard of Google Translate? And they were amazed at how accurate it is. It's incredibly accurate. These people are just, their jaw drops when they when they see it. And so, you know, we have this Google Translate that can now do so well for human languages and yet the, the ability for, uh, you know, technology to explain itself properly to humans is still a huge gray area and you know, this is the decade where we're really going to start figuring this out. And look, if we don't figure it out this decade, we're going to have to figure it out next decade because by then we'll have much more powerful quantum computers. But uh, you know, And it's also in the quantum realm that we'll probably will have computers that spark into some sort of sentience or some sort of conscience because we will have that next order of magnitude of technological advancement. Now, the current binary computers probably just aren't smart enough yet, but these, this coming age of quantum computing is most likely the one that is going to have computers with more than enough power to start you know, fully simulating human minds and um, truly being sentient. That's Alex Harrow-Vroit from ity.com. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 